Here is a recording of the first part of an important presentation made by evolutionary epidemiologist Rob Wallace at a meeting of the Workers International Network, or WIN, to which I belong. Rob explains how it's capitalist production that is really at the heart of the development of COVID-19 and similar diseases. Rob was introduced by myself, John Ryman. Well, comrades, I'm speaking from here in California, where right at the moment, we're experiencing a perfect trifecta of the clash between capitalist production and the laws of nature. We have an extreme heat wave. Smoke throughout the state is filling the air uh, from the unprecedented forest fires. Meanwhile, they're having to ev evacuate tens of thousands of people due to these fires, but where are they going to evacuate them to? Because social distancing is necessary due to COVID-19. And make no mistake, this pandemic is part of the clash between capitalism and the natural world, as Rob Wallace will explain. Therefore, as socialists, it is absolutely essential that we have an understanding of the actual science involved and that we explain this understanding to the rest of our class. And it's an honor to introduce Rob Wallace, to whom we owe a special debt of gratitude. We've all experienced uh, job losses, ostracism, blacklisting, and more in the struggle uh, for an understanding of society and for a better world. And Rob is one of those who has made those same sacrifices. As he writes in this book, Big Farms Make Big Flu, he says, while once I had a promising career as an evolutionary biologist studying influenza, this is he wrote this before COVID-19, consulting for the UN's Food and Agricultural Organization and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, I now find myself professionally ostracized, indeed on the precipice of earning the moniker of an enemy of the state. The blacklisting stems from the decisions I have made about the nature of science. And he explains, big food has entered a strategic alliance with influenza. As I said, that was before COVID-19. Agribusiness, backed by state power uh, at home and abroad, is now working as much with influenza as against it. Rob presently works with the, with the agroecology and the rural research corporations. He's the author of Big Farms Make Big Flu, which if you haven't read it, I urge you to do so. And he co-authored a forthcoming book, Clear Cutting Disease Control, Capital-Led Deforestation, Public Health Austerity, and Vector-Borne Infection. And with that, on behalf of the Workers International Network, uh, we welcome Rob Wallace, and I'm sure we're all very much looking forward to uh, what he has to say. Thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you very much. I appreciate that, John and Ed and everybody there. Um, uh, you guys are always in the future now, of course. You're uh, six, seven hours ahead of me, so um, I'm wondering how things are going over there in the future. So, sorry, <laughs> lame joke, but um, it's wonderful to be here. And um, um, I think what I'll do is I'll speak for about 20, 25 minutes, and then we can open up for a conversation. Um, I think... Um, what I'll do is I'll start off with a um, a kind of um, kind of a review about where we are, and um, you know, clearly, obviously, we are in the middle of a pandemic, uh, COVID nineteen. Um, it's uh, caused by a virus called SARS two, which implies that there was a SARS one, and yes, uh, two thousand two, uh, SARS one emerged uh, in Guangdong, which is southeastern province in uh, China. Um, and it went on to infect uh, 8,000 people, killing about 10%. Um, and we were very lucky that we were able to, uh, you know, when I say we, I'm speaking about the humanity, we were able to maneuver it uh, into uh, basically burning out, uh, in part because the infection uh, is not, uh, it's not infectious until you start showing symptoms. So as soon as anybody with SARS-1 starts showing in, uh, in, uh, symptoms, we were able to uh, isolate them and, and cut off the chain of transmission. Unfortunately, we're not able to do that with SARS-2, the virus that causes COVID-19. Uh, it's uh, along 
well, there's a lot of reasons we'll get into, but uh, one of the things uh, up, we're up against is that it's infectious even before anyone shows symptoms. So, um, you know, any of us walking around would seem in perfect health. Uh, even those of us who may be infected but uh, don't even develop symptoms are in fact uh, proving to be the major source of new infections uh, from person to person. So, you know, um, I, I began uh, my career as uh, John says, an evolutionary biologist. I still consider myself an evolutionary biologist, but uh, I was looking at genetic sequences of uh, uh, avian influenza, if you remember at the turn of the century, H5N1, that was the first celebrity virus of the, the new uh, batch. Uh, we were all concerned about, we were concerned in part, we were all in, uh, in some ways freaked out over the fact that uh, H5N1 emerged, uh, spilled over directly from uh, poultry right into humans. At that time, we didn't know that that could be a possibility. We thought that most influences had to be channeled through hog before uh, hitting humans. Uh, I was looking at uh, genetic sequences for H5N1, and from there you can basically make family trees based on uh, how closely related the genetic sequences are. And then because you know where the uh, samples, uh, the isolates were sampled, where the genetic sequence were taken from uh, in terms of their location, you can uh, in essence infer how the virus moved from place to place just from the genetic sequences. Now I made the mistake being curious about something and uh, in science that's not always the best career move. Um, so I, uh, I wanted to know why did H5N1 emerge in Guangdong in uh, 1997 and um, you know, what was going on. So I got into uh, things like the history of agriculture in the region, the political economy of agribusiness and uh, you know, broadening out to because at uh, some point the things uh, in the genetic sequence can't speak to particular questions. Um, now it proved, it, it's, it, proved to be, H5N1 proved to be the uh, first of many uh, new pathogens that seem to be emerging almost on an annual basis here. So H5N1, we had um, uh, H9N2, we had H7N9, more influenzas. Uh, if you remember 2009, we, we did have a pandemic, uh, H, H1N1 2009 that emerged off hog farms outside Mexico City before spreading around the world. Uh, at the time, we were very fearful that would be uh, another big one like 1918. It proved to be less virulent, less deadly as uh, we, uh, we uh, were worried about, but it did kill 500,000 people that first year. So um, it was um, something that's uh, maybe a footnote that uh, many people don't remember that, um, you know, you get an infection out onto the global travel network uh, and you're in a position to be able to infect uh, a large portion of the of the human race in a way that uh, uh, in centuries past wasn't quite the case. There have been, of course, pandemics past, but we're at a place where our global travel network is so integrated that a virus that emerges out of uh, outside Mexico City or out or uh, in the um, uh, deepest uh, forest in Africa or uh, within a cave in in China can go from that cave uh, and circulate about and, you know, get on the, uh, a, a plane and be on the other side of the world in, in no time. Uh, so it's not merely a matter of how deadly any one of these viruses are, you know, whether it's 10% death rate or 5% or 1%. If you have, like SARS-2, COVID-19 virus, a uh, case fatality rate of 1%. Uh, if you can get out on the global travel network and infect most of the world, uh, you infect, um, you know, 4 billion people at 1%, uh, that's uh, uh, many millions of people were killed, even by a virus that isn't ostensibly uh, that deadly. Um, so, um, you know, uh, so you figure fill out that list. Um, I was giving a list of uh, influenzas. There's, there's SARS-1, there's the MERS, the Me uh, Middle East, uh, Eastern uh, Respiratory Syndrome virus that is in the same family as SARS-1. Uh, there is, um, uh, there was Q fever in the Netherlands. There was uh, uh, Ebola, Makona in West Africa, as you know, there was uh, Zika and, you know, Typically, what happens is any one of these pathogens emerges, we kind of race to our computer and look it up. Uh, you know, it's virology, it's clinical course, it's epidemiology, 
its potential origins, and we get all sucked down into those details, as we should, because uh, indeed it is uh, an emergency, we're worried about it. Um, but unfortunately, what happens is, is that the focus on the emergency aspect of it kind of, um, uh, kind of gets, distracts us from discussing some of the more structural uh, causes for why these viruses emerge. And um, it happens to be with COVID-19, uh, well, there's one uh, horrible irony about it is that our team and others weren't focused on another SARS, even though SARS were circulating uh, since 2002. Many teams have been uh, um, sampling SARS across Central and Southern China, but across uh, all the world, in fact, in bats, which are the typical uh, reservoir for some of these diseases. Um, so, you know, but our focus was on African swine fever, uh, which had uh, over several decades emerged out of Africa, hit the hog industries in uh, Europe, more recently into Eastern Europe and into China, where from 2018 to 2019, it killed half of, of uh, China's hog. Um, hog. China's the largest hog producer in the world. And given how closely related the hog immune system is to the human uh, immune system, uh, many of us were uh, had our eye on on the African swine fever. Um, so what, what I'm getting at here is I did speak of it. Uh, we have these pathogens emerging almost on an annual basis at this point, but it, uh, uh, in actuality they are uh, emerging almost in parallel. So uh, you can have your eye on the ball for one of them and miss out another one uh, that uh, you know. Uh, you know, came in out from underneath your expectation or, or understanding. And um, so there is an aspect of a kind of random, uh, random nature to how these pathogens are emerging, but it doesn't mean that it's all chaotic and completely randomized. Uh, there is, as I was getting at, despite when you have a series of emergencies one after the other, then you start to get a picture that there's something uh, uh, profoundly ha has changed in the nature of how uh, uh, pathogens are being uh, selected for and are, are emerging in, in a way that they hadn't uh, uh, and weren't emerging at this pace nor at in this kind of uh, diversity. And so some of these pathogens are, you know, have been around for a while, but suddenly they have uh, uh, an opportunity that they didn't have before. Uh, and historically speaking, that's been the case. If you go back to the beginning of, of civilizations so when we became more sessile, uh, in the early days in Mesopotamia uh, and in Africa, you know, we uh, became uh, more into uh, organizing ourselves into towns. Uh, acute uh, infections like influenza and diphtheria uh, suddenly had a population of humans that uh, could host uh, such an acute infection and uh, still be able to circulate about. So with our growing livestock and, uh, and our uh, increasing concentration, uh, influenzas and diphtherias and other pathogens like that suddenly had a hold in the human population didn't have before. And basically across human uh, history, as we've changed our mode of social reproduction, uh, we've uh, provided barriers to uh, infections that previously infected us, and we've also, also opened up opportunities for new infections. I think the one that immediately comes to mind is uh, uh, HIV. Uh, some of the phylogeography, that's the science uh, that I was just describing, you know, you like genetic sequences and from there you can reconstruct how these viruses moved around. Well, they are able to figure out that the, uh, the uh, HIV, HIV-1, that's the major uh, HIV that uh, uh, went pandemic, uh, originated uh, uh, from uh, simian immunodeficiency viruses, SIVs, that were circulating in, in chimpanzee uh, groups in southeastern uh, Cameroon, and they were able to date it to 1908, uh, give or uh, take uh, uh, 20 years. And about that time, it's, uh, it's when uh, colonization arrived in Cameroon, at least European version of it, and you have the French and Germans uh, basically fighting over how to best uh, engage in the extractivism of the area. Um, so um, SIVs may have been spilling over into human uh, uh, indigenous groups for hundreds if not thousands of years, but now you have a, a change in the landscape in such a way that uh, 
the deepest forests are now suddenly connected to the coast as colonial enterprises engage in the extractivism of uh, rubber and uh, palm oil and uh, logging and uh, and uh, you know forcing um, uh, indigenous groups into hard labor. Uh, you change the sex biases of, of these groups and you increase the, you turn things, everything from sex to bushmeat into a commodity uh, and in such a way you increase the interface between the SIVs and the human populations and you allow a chain of transmission that uh, wasn't the case before as the uh, indigenous groups are typically uh, isolated in, in uh, the deeper parts of, of what is now Cameroon and, and the Congo. Uh, so in other words, historically speaking, this has, has been going on for some time. So what COVID-19 did for our group is that we finally put some pieces together and were able to develop a kind of a, of a model of our way of thinking about it that some is able to encapsulate all the different types of pathogens that have emerged this century. And our notion is, is that uh, it's primarily organized around uh, uh, circuits of capital uh, are driving uh, the development and uh, deforestation that's leading to the increase of interface between wild reservoirs for many of these pathogens and uh, spilling over into humans. And the way we look at it is in terms of a circuit of production. Uh, in a very abstract way, we begin with uh, those pathogens that spill over at the contact of deforestation. So Ebola typically is hosted by bats that are frugivores or insectivores. Um, and we see in 2013, uh, the er emergence of Ebola, Macona, that uh, in genetically speaking, in terms of its biology, really not that different from Ebola's that were spilling uh, as far back as the 1970s. Typically, up until that point, Ebola would hit a village or two or kill a, 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 a chimp or ch a gorilla um, troop. Terrible thing. You kill 90% of the villagers, um, but then they would burn out on its own. Now we have in 2013, Ebola Macona arise and infect 35,000 people, killing 11,000 living bodies in the streets of uh, regional capitals and threatening to go pandemic. And for a, uh, a virulent pathogen like that, that was uh, in indeed uh, quite a scare. So what happened? I mean, if the virus didn't change, what did happen? And uh, our group uh, uh, looked into it and uh, we uh, put out a book with the title called Neoliberal Ebola. Uh, it's our notion that the political economy of the area changed in such a way that uh, in essence allowed um, uh, the Ebola in West Africa to spill over into the humans and make its way into the local regional capital. So uh, Liberia at the time had been uh, colonized uh, since uh, as far back as 1925, Firestone Rubber, all that. Um, Guinea nearby, uh, and only in the last uh, 10, 20 years, uh, it started to engage in that kind of, um, uh, kind of export economy. First, they engage, produced these parastatal companies dedicated toward uh, kind of nationalizing palm production and uh, basically taking it away out of small holder hands to try to get up to some sort of economy of scale that would attract international capital. So it was that point in, in its classic uh, Marx in the sense of, uh, you know, uh, primitive accumulation, all the things you want to go back to England um, at the beginning of, of modern capitalism. Uh, it's starting off in Guinea rather late, but you will recognize all the attributes of uh, land grabbing and enclosure and uh, proletarianization, or at least a semi-proletarianization where, uh, you know, farmers there would work for the company part-time and then make their way to the city uh, to, uh, you know, to gain a little bit more money before they came back and help with the family plot. So you have that cycle migration going on from the deepest forest to the, to the regional capital. And uh, in, as far as the bats themselves, uh, as um, you have more plantation palm oil develop, uh, you know, most species uh, are lost uh, upon uh, deforestation, but some species do quite well. And uh, the bats, uh, they don't just roll over and die. They, uh, they look at the plantations and start to roost there and what's not to like no predators, no competitors. You have a nice uh, space um, to go from your roosting site to your foraging site. And then of course you have an in inter uh, increasing interface with the human, the labor on the plantation. 
Uh, and then uh, because labor's uh, migrating back and forth between the rural areas and the, and the urban areas, you have a straight shot from deepest forest all the way to the regional capitals. So that's at the, um, at, that's at the end of the, uh, in terms of the interface directly at the point of deforestation. Other pathogens are emerging on the uh, other end of that kind of circuit of production. So a lot of the avian and swine influenzas are emerging uh, uh, more along the industrial hog and poultry operations would typically straddle, um, straddle the, the uh, urban areas. And uh, as uh, big uh, uh, agriculture expands around the world, you see we're being increasingly um, uh, encircled by cities of hog and poultry. Uh, not just China, not just the U.S., but uh, increasingly uh, uh, in countries around the world. Um, so that end of it, we have closer to the city, and then you have pathogens that emerge along the circuit, and Zika comes to mind, uh, came out of Africa, hopscotched across uh, um, East Asia, uh, uh, the Pacific area, and then uh, into Brazil, um, primarily an urban disease, but it doesn't mean its dynamics are divorced from what's going on in Brazil. Uh, Brazil, China, uh, India, they're all engaged in the BRICS road of capitalist production. They want to get a big F you to uh, EU and the US. We're going to do capitalism our way. We're going to pull our people out of poverty that way. And of course, leaving millions behind as, uh, in poverty as well. Um, but uh, in the course of developing their own forests in that way, uh, that is their version of uh, increasing the uh, uh, interface between uh, reservoirs of disease and humans. Uh, the rural areas are not, the, the, you don't really have this easy urban rural divide anymore. You have these kind of peri-urban continuums in which rural areas start taking the characteristics of urban areas. Um, you have rural areas act as kind of foo hubs for agribusiness export. Uh, and so uh, you're really disconnecting all these previous ecologies that in essence act as a buffer to keep pathogens from emerging. And you're smoothing out those complexities in a way that allows pathogens that uh, had difficulty lining up hosts to be able to uh, transmit host to host. Now you, you've simplified the forest and some of those pathogens that are able to survive have a much straighter shop through that peri-urban um, a continuum to the city. As far as Zika goes, um, it engages in what's called reciprocal activation with other pathogens, things like dengue and yellow fever. Uh, when uh, someone's con uh, infected both by Zika and these other pathogens, the pathogens help each other out in terms of their biochemical pathways, and you can have an infection that becomes that much worse. So uh, even an urban pathogen, uh, its dynamics are dependent on how uh, uh, forests are being uh, developed as well. Now, so here in our mind, we, we begin to organize all these different types of pathogen within the circuit production. What about COVID-19, SARS-2? Uh, it's, uh, uh, well, there are different um, ideas of its origin, but in terms of this framework here, uh, we have um, uh, SARS being uh, uh, collected and uh, uh, cataloged since 2002 when SARS-1 emerged and uh, discovered uh, all sorts of different types of uh, SARS-like uh, pathogens in bats across southern and, and uh, central China, spilling over multiple times into all sorts of different animals. Uh, you have the kind of wild food sector, you know, all, uh, all in the wet markets, various animals are being sold, not just your traditional poultry and livestock. You have um, all sorts of uh, civets and snakes and, and, and such that are also being uh, sold as food. It's not a huge part of the food sector, but it is being increasingly becoming industrialized in a way that um, makes that easy dichotomy go away. You know, the notion of, oh, industrial food here, wild foods over here. Well, some of the same money bags are being beginning to support both those types of uh, kinds of food, industrializing more wild foods in a way that they hadn't been previously. And both sectors are competing uh, for land, uh, cutting into the forests uh, in such a way that they can grow their livestock um, in the last of the virgin farmland, as it were. 
And so we have this pressing pressure on uh, uh, central and southern uh, Chinese forests, uh, cutting up, up against uh, where SARS was circulating among bats. Uh, point of reference, points of information. Uh, bats are thought to be able to harbor many of the most virulent pathogens like Ebola, like SARS, uh, in part because they're the only mammal that flies. So there's a real premium on having an immune system that works really well which puts pressure on the pathogens that do infect that immune system to keep up and really replicate at high speeds in such a way that it should it spill over into animals that don't have that kind of immune system, uh, it's gonna do considerable damage. Uh, so uh, SARS-2 was really just one of many, 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 many uh, SARS-like pathogens that are circulating in the area and um, uh, it, um, although there was a lot of focus on the Wuhan uh, live market, uh, considerable more analysis, both of genetics and the ecology indicate that uh, in all likelihood SARS-2 was circulating uh, for as far back as uh, 40 years, and that it may have been circulating in hum uh, humans for a long time before it, it finalized the last uh, mutation necessary to go really fast uh, human to human. Um, so in other words, there's another like Zika, it is uh, circulating along uh, that circuit of production from deep forest to the peri-urban areas to the rural area, uh, to the urban areas. Uh, it's splattering across its uh, uh, traditional livestock, including hog and Guangdong in 2018, uh, in uh, the wild foods that we were talking, in humans directly. Uh, so, you know, it, 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 it's almost a matter of chance. If you keep rolling the dice, at some point one of these stars uh, figures out that how to do this. Now, what that speaks of is that we may be still in quite grave danger. If you have three major SARS emerged in, since 2002, it really speaks to the pace that, that SARS is on in terms of uh, experimenting with the human immune system. It doesn't look pretty. Uh, if we think we're in a bad situation now, of course, I am always a harbinger of really good news, I'm sorry. But if you have um, SARS uh, merging at this pace, it's unlikely that we won't be waiting uh, from 1918 to 2018 as it were. We won't be waiting another 100 years for a really nasty one to emerge. As terrible as this one is, in some sense we are uh, lucky. It's only uh, as a case fatality rate of, of 1%. Um, but uh, the important point is, and uh, you know, to speak to the, the kind of the introduction, and then I'll wrap up here uh, for now, and then we can open up for discussion. But um, you know, the, the point is, is that it's it's really such a focus on the emergency aspect of. I mean, every time one of these pathogens comes up, the kind of um, ca the political class and the the scientific class uh, that works for them focuses on the emergency, as they should, but often at the expense of ever uh, dealing with the structural aspects that led to the emergence of not just this SARS-2, but all the pathogens in the last decade. It's like we're all supposed to forget everything that happened to, that, to get us to a point that we've arrived uh, in which industrial, ag industrial agriculture is selecting for multiple pathogens that are virulent, very infectious, uh, uh, cutting into the forest, uh, letting an increased diversity of pathogens spill over. And it uh, has fundamental, uh, fundamentally to do with the nature of, of agriculture these days. It's become more, uh, what was previously a more natural economy where farmers, they grew things. Uh, they were all agroecologists until about a hundred years ago when they started to apply Taylorism, uh, Taylorizing the agriculture and making it more of an industrial economy. The thing is though, uh, that in the course of industrializing our livestock and our crops, we also industrialize the pathogens that circulate among them. So we end up circulating, uh, selecting for strains that are more virulent and, and more infectious and be, by virtue of the global travel network, able to go from one end of the world to the other in a matter of weeks uh, in such a way that, uh, and particularly at a time and place uh, where austerity reigns, public health budgets have been cut to the bone, uh, clearly, England and the U.S. Uh, were similar in our neoliberal metaphysics of uh, assuming just gutting public health as a, as a notion of a public commons and also monetizing it, uh, though you're quite not where we are. Uh, even under Obamacare, we're at 28 million people without uh, health insurance, 24 million underinsured. Uh, public health is basically uh, struck down to 
your, uh, you know, your personal relationship with your doctor. So in effect, while we ramped up the power of pathogens to damage us at the global scale, we've reduced our capacity to control outbreaks, both uh, within the uh, uh, agriculture sector and also as a matter of public health. Rob replied to a question about vaccines. Then I, I'm not a fan of the notion of vaccines causing the damage uh, at all. I, uh, as far as um, it goes, um, I'm actually hoping that there's a vaccine that's developed. I don't like how we're arriving at that moment. Uh, here in the U.S., uh, the uh, NIH uh, version of it is on a fast track to try to get Trump reelected and to basically uh, get people to take it, even though it's not through a phase three testing yet. So um, I, in order for it to, uh, to maintain the trust of uh, the population, you need to make sure that the vaccines are developed well and tested uh, in such a way. And historically speaking, vaccines have uh, basically, uh, other than a bad reaction now and then, for the most part, uh, mortality rates for some of these uh, outbreaks that we uh, were basically ravaged uh, England and elsewhere for uh, uh, hundreds of years or been basically removed off the board by virtue of vaccines. Um, you know, I think the focus on vaccines is another way of uh, avoiding taking responsibility for how these uh, pathogens emerge in the first place. And I think a lot of our scientists today are in essence, uh, you know, they're the guy at the circus who cleans up after the elephant, right? All the turds there, you need somebody to do that. But uh, it takes away from the notion of, um, well, how is the elephant um, able to move about in the first place? Meaning, how are these pathogens emerging from the, in the first place? Uh, gets away from uh, capital-led uh, deforestation development driving the outbreaks. Uh, so we can do one of the same thing. Uh, the left has a proud history of, um, of uh, fighting against uh, uh, capitalist incursions into nature. Uh, destroying uh, our wealth and both our labor and uh, our natural resources. And it has a proud history of fighting uh, for the rights of uh, working people to get the latest in uh, um, uh, medical uh, uh, medicine and medical technology. So both those things go hand in glove. As far as children go, they do get infected. They just uh, are not uh, uh, at this point damaged, uh, though in, we do have increasing reports of uh, it being the case. It has to do in part with uh, kind of the molecular biology of it all. Uh, long story short, uh, as we get older, we tend to have more of the receptor that's uh, uh, more the doorway in which the virus enters our cells. That also explains in part the difference between uh, uh, the, the, the worst cases in men and women. Men tend to have more of these, uh, this receptor than, than women do. So there are uh, bio, biomolecular and clinical explanations for why there's a difference between uh, various demographics in terms of getting uh, uh, sickened. Um, but, uh, you know, as far as, oh, well, if children aren't getting sick, we send them to school. Well, what happens to the teachers who uh, are teaching them? Are we just gonna send them in to uh, uh, be infected and killed by this? What happens to the parents when the kids come back uh, home? Uh, this is already in spades uh, here in the United States, Georgia, uh, state here, uh, really gave a F you to uh, the notion of public health, uh, brought the children into school. It was a real ideological battle uh, to make that happen. Uh, and of course, they closed down in a matter of weeks because uh, you had high infection rates. Universities here, are kind of neoliberal universities are, are running a scam, basically. Uh, they're having the students come in uh, for the fall semester, then the students get together, they get sick or, or infected, they pass it on to people who work there, uh, professors, their parents, and then the university says, see, these uh, kids aren't doing what's right in terms of maintaining social distance, and therefore we're, we're going to an online program. Meanwhile, we're going to keep their tuition and their, uh, their money that they pay for for the dorm. Uh, but the universities are in desperate straits that you know, once they're neoliberalized, they are not getting support from the state. They're down to uh, running these kinds of scams as far as uh, making sure money still comes in. 
So I, I would say that, um, you know, um, we, there is good reason for distrusting governments in terms of how this is going down. The, class, the, the state has a class character. It is operating in favor of making sure that the uh, system of uh, profit continues on forward without disruption. That's why they send uh, uh, people, you know, workers back into the meatpacking plants. Um, that's why, uh, you know, they're, they're providing very little support for um, health workers in terms of PPE and all this. Uh, better to reduce the outlays to stop the outbreak and, but keep the machine going and uh, have the worst outcomes in terms of death and disease of, upon working people. Uh, so there is reason to, to push back against uh, the government. Uh, and there is reason to uh, distrust some of their uh, scientific conclusions and their medical advice. Uh, everything from uh, on your end, Bojo's notion of um, uh, herd immunity, Although we're so far behind here in the United States, we've only finally now arrived at herd immunity as a rationale for doing nothing. Uh, you know, the notion of just letting the virus burn through the population and, and producing uh, enough immunity to keep us from being infected, which is at best only a passing thing. Um, but at the same time, uh, you know, we should also be uh, clear that there is a scientific basis for some of the things that we would want. And uh, as you know, there uh, for historically speaking, uh, working people, uh, science has been hand in glove with capitalism uh, in terms of producing the kind of imperial state that we see uh, right from the beginning of the age of exploration or colonialism. Uh, when the Portuguese first arrived on those islands off Africa, they were confronted by people and plants they didn't understand. So they needed scientists to decode them and to recode them into commodified objects uh, and, and uh, sources of labor. Uh, so science has a terrible track record. On the other hand, working people have been involved in uh, scientific enterprises for uh, uh, hundreds of years and engaged in uh, understanding and reading up on science and understanding that there's a material basis to uh, our, our conditions, um, our living, uh, our living uh, expenses, all those things. And uh, uh, we have a proud history of um, you know, reading up on science and, making, and keeping up abreast of all the major developments. And so uh, we, I would advise that we avoid the kind of more uh, conspiratorial stuff. There's nothing wrong with asking questions. I don't mind that at all. But there is a, 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 a material basis by which we can uh, make decisions about um, uh, what is best for uh, working people in a way that the state is increasingly abandoning. After an extended discussion in which many important points were raised, Rob gave a reply to the entire conversation. For simplicity's sake, I'm going to make that as a second video. But just to give you a little taste of what Rob said, in his summation, he pointed out that even those of us who are radicalized often accept the premises of our enemies, and that we must accept that those who are running things are a bunch of psychopaths, and we have to stop accepting that those who run things know what the hell they are doing. So that second part will be posted soon, and I urge you to take the time to listen to that also.